Like a flying thing like a bee. Ah! Sonny Liston was a boy. The one group of people who were not afraid of Liston. And who Liston was actually a little afraid of were the crazy people. If Sonny Liston even dreamed he beat me, he'd apologize. He's too ugly to be the world champ. The world champ should be pretty like me. He didn't make him doubt himself so much as he didn't, I'm going to get in the ring with a crazy guy. Who the hell knows what he's going to do? Clay went at him, hammer and tongs never let up. It was all in that. But Sonny bought it. Don't you have any respect for him at all? As a fighter? As a fighter? I think he should be locked up for impersonating a fighter. For all his pre-fight mayhem, Clay, undefeated in 19 bouts, was no impersonator. But Liston didn't just win, he devastated knocking out 25 of his 36 opponents. The contrast between them couldn't have been sharper. Clay was the exuberant exhibitionist, Liston the silent enforcer. Not too many guys you watch a jumping roll that make you nervous. This is a bad man. When you got hit by Sonny Liston's jab, it felt like you were getting hit with a telephone pole. Possibly the greatest left jab in the history of the heavyweight division. That left jab could go through brick walls. It was like learning that another country had the atom bomb and they were coming at you. He seemed invincible. He was this devastating, hulking figure who was just beating opponents, knocking them out. This wasn't going to be any fight at all. He was going to spank this baby. He trained for maybe a four-round fight. Which is about how long he thought it would take him to dispose of this young upstart. I thought Sonny Liston was going to be champion for 147 years. This guy could not get out with a jam. My assignment was to get in my rental car and go back and forth between the arena and the nearest hospital emergency room so I would not waste a moment of deadline time following Cassius Clay into intensive care. Of the 46 writers covering the fight, only three picked Clay to win. Fight fans across all social strata agreed. A lot of people in the black community who at this point kind of would think it Clay's a clown, so I'd rather see Liston win. The press wanted Sonny to beat the loudmouth from Louisville. They didn't like Clay at all. Dislike turned into distrust when news reports revealed Clay's association with Malcolm X of the Nation of Islam. Although the fight's promoters prevailed upon the high-profile leader to leave Clay's camp, the pre-fight atmosphere was negatively charged with schism and fear. Meanwhile, Liston's underworld connections were leading some fans to suspend and throw the bout. On February 25th, the fighters squared undersold crowd in Miami Beach. Liston wants to pump that jab to set up his other punches. He can get this kid to stand still. His speed was so predominant. Liston, he made Liston look like he was standing still. And Liston was not slow. Liston is beginning to question what's going on here. Nobody told me this guy was this fast. Now Clay realizes, I'm faster than this guy. Liston's corner decides to put ointment on his gloves and his shoulder. It is possible with the intention of getting it in Clay's eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't know exactly what happened. They're yelling from Cassius Clay's corner, something got in his right eye. When he came back and he says, cut my, I said, sit down. Put my pinky in his eye and put it in my eye. It did burn. I put the water in his eyes. I'm wiping him clean. That's Angelo Dundee that he was arguing with, Joe. Angelo up a little bit while he gets him ready. Dundee says, this is for the championship, kid. You are going out there. Right there, and he's bouncing away continually. Liston is trying to knock him out. He's trying to get to a, a blind Cassius Clay, and he can't do it. And Liston, by that round, is already exhausted. And Clay pulled the greatest escape act since Houdini. He survived that fifth round. And then in round six, his vision cleared. And Liston found himself on the defensive. The champion has slowed down a bit. His face was just knots all up and down and cut when I was near the... I mean, he was the picture of defeat.
after the fight, everyone who would pick Sonny all had to have a reason why Sonny lost. And the first reason they gave was fix. They had to be a fix. They just didn't want to admit Clay had won the fight. From the depths of his humiliation, Liston could not accept responsibility for his loss, blaming it on a shoulder injury. And I went back to my corner. The whole glove felt like it was full of water. His arm was just aching, and I was the one that was rubbing with winter green and alcohol. They took him to the hospital, and, and there never was a valid report on what had happened to that particular shoulder. Don't give up the heavyweight championship of the world, the single most valuable prize in all of sports, because your shoulder hurts. His one weakness in the fight was his lack of heart. Once you take his gun away, he turned into a sissy. Well, it's true. There was a time when he proudly brand he was born in January 1932. His mother has named two or three different dates. She can remember it being in the middle of January, a cold night. And then a couple of years later, she said, oh, it was July. In whatever month or season, Charles Sonny Liston was born in a tenant shack outside Forest City, Arkansas. The 24th of 20 children claimed to have been sired by his father, Toby, and one of 11 to his mother, Helen. His early years were hard-bitten, hungry, and violent. His father beat him every day, either for doing something or just for something to do. When Johnny Taco first saw him take off his shirt, he looked at his back and he saw bird tracks up and down his back. And he said, what are all those marks? And he said, I had been there. Sonny would help his father do his work rather than go to school, which accounts for his comparatively poor education. In 1946, Helen Liston decided she had enough and escaped to St. Louis, leaving Sonny in the unloving hands of his father. Isolated and confused, he left the farm and went in search of his mother. He had no sense of self. He had no feelings of identity. He had nothing to attach himself to. He turned up in St. Louis expecting the first person he asked would know where his mother was. She claims that the police took him in until she came to pick him up. Unable to read and write, the teenager tried to make a living on the streets of St. Louis. He would engage in a crime, and the witnesses would describe a bright yellow shirt, and he'd continue to wear that shirt for the next couple of days. In 1950, he was charged with six muggings, one that netted him a sense. He was also caught robbing a diner and two gas stations, and was sentenced for five years to the Missouri State Penitentiary at Jefferson City. The prison had a boxing program. He begins to box, wipes out the competition, gets the attention of a priest, Father Stevens, who takes Liston under his wing. They had a very hard time getting him exercise because they had to put two or three convicts in the ring to fight against him. After serving two years and four months, Liston was released into the care of his new family, a coterie of fight managers with ties to John Vitale, the St. Louis underworld figure. Sonny had a new career, however dark. He was hired to go around and intimidate people. If they needed a kneecap broken, uh, dial Sonny Liston. He used Sonny to break up union protests, to knock heads, put people back into line. He was like killed by the racketeers and sent out to fight when they wanted him to. The only place he could find a palpable, tangible reward was in that prize ring. In 1953, Liston turned pro and won seven consecutive fights. A success in the ring, he found little joy outside of it. Encounters with the local police were frequent. St. Louis in the 1950s was a segregated city. People had their enclave where they lived, where they went to school. If you're anywhere out of this area, you're anywhere that people think you shouldn't be, then uh, you're going to be stopped by the police. We were out running one morning along Little Boulevard. There are mansions and well-to-do homes there. Police pulled up, put his gun on us, made us put our heads up, and he thought we were running from a burglar. All the squad cars in a particular part of St. Louis 